Agricultural broadband and rural development is now in order. A quorum is present. Folks, as you're settling in, just a couple quick orders of business. Uh, the first is I would like to remind members uh, that um, all questions uh, and all uh, moments of speaking have to be directed through the chair. Uh, that's not, in my understanding, an issue of hierarchy. It is instead a concern for folks who are watching at home. Uh, we may know that this is not a hybrid hearing, so there are not spotlight moments where we're being focused on when we're speaking. We just have this really big lens, and the people who are watching at home need to know who's speaking. So please, a reminder to all members that if you'd like to speak, be recognized by the chair, uh, and that recognition has to proceed also through our interactions with testifiers. I'd also like to acknowledge that we have a new member and, and give uh, Senator Anderson a moment to introduce himself, if he would so choose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Senator Bruce Anderson, represent Senate District 29, which covers a little bit of uh, Hennepin County, Rockford Town, the city of Rockford goes into Hennepin County. I have uh, the uh, southern part and western part of Wright County, and then the uh, western part of my district goes into Meeker County, which includes Kingston, Kingston Township. Uh, this is my fourth term in the uh, Senate, and uh, my second opportunity to be on the Ag Committee. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Now we have two uh, major uh, moments of business uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first will be a presentation by the Office of Broadband Development, and the second will be a presentation by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So uh, to begin, uh, our presentation by the Office of Brad Broadband Development, um, would uh, Ms. Mackey please take the uh, position and introduce yourself, full name, and your position for the record, please, and then commence your testimony. All right, well, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Senators. For the record, my name is Bree Mackey, and I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Broadband Development. And I'd also like to take a moment to introduce Darielle Dannon with our office as well, who will be here to assist me. I'm really excited to be here uh, with the Senate Ag, Broadband, and Rural Development Committee. Um, I am also a Greater Minnesota girl, and for those of you who know Southeast Minnesota, the other side of Highway 14, I'm from Winona County in a little area called Lewiston. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you today and share some of the background of the Office of Broadband Development, the programs that we administer, the progress we have made, and other opportunities we are currently partnering in. During this presentation, I would like to welcome any clarifying questions you may have and want to visit during my presentation. I will do my very best to answer them. Um, I will also be happy to take questions at the end. If we do need to follow up, we are happy to do that as well if I, myself or Darielle, do not have the answers for you today. And with that, Mr. Chair, Senators, I'm happy to jump right in. So the first slide here on the screen gives a timeline, and I know it's very small, and I apologize for that, but I do wanna hit a couple of highlights within this. So since 2008, uh, the first broadband task force was created by statute. And further down a couple years, uh, we did have broadband goals that were established, and at those time, those were 10-5, and that was to hit that by 2015. <laughs> In 2011, the Dayton administration created the first broadband task force by executive order for his administration. And then in 2014, the Border to Border Infrastructure Grant Program uh, was created into law, and at that time, $20 million was appropriated. When we jump down to the next arrow, I wanna highlight 2016, the broadband goals were revised, and those revisions were 25-3 by 2000. Uh, 22. 
And then um, we also created goals of 100 by 20 by 2026. At that point, there was also $35 million appropriated in the grant program. In 2019, I want to highlight that the Border to Border Grant Program had $20 million appropriated for the 2020 year, and then also we created the Telecommuter Forward Program. And at this time, Governor Walls created his uh, task force on broadband as well. And finally, jumping to 2022. The governor approved 25 million, or little, it was almost a million, or hundred million dollars uh, for broadband grants for 61 projects in 48 counties across our great state. And um, we also used funding that was leveraged um, from our capital projects fund um, to utilize and do those projects. And then as you also may know, we also have our current RFP program for the current round out there on our website, and that has over $60 million in funds. Uh, and also we created the low density pilot program and the line extension program. And those are both new and I'll go over a little bit more in later slides. With that, I just want to highlight one piece of the policy framework that I'm really excited to share um, is the digital equity piece that is new. Um, you know, we, for a long time in Minnesota, have focused really strongly on the infrastructure piece, and we're doing an incredible job with that, and there's still much work to be done. But incorporating digital equity in all of our work is a really exciting piece uh, for our office and uh, for DEED and the state. Again, as a reminder, our goals uh, listed 2022 to have at least 25 uh, by three, and our goals in 2026 is 100 by 20. So with that, where are we at? In this slide, um, we have done a lot, um, and we're really excited about that, but we also recognize that about 12% of of our state still do not meet the goals of the 100 by 20. And of that 12, almost 12%, 80% are in greater Minnesota. We know that those are the hardest areas to serve and also may, most expensive to serve. And this also equates um, to about in rural Minnesota between around one out of three households that do not have the 100 by 20 speeds. The next couple of slides I just want to show, and I know they're hard to see on the screen, um, but sort of um, where we are at. So the first two slides um, are based on county data. Um, and so you can sort of see where the gaps still are um, across the state. And again, um, the 100 by 20 is about 12%. You can see the 88.29% um, statewide have that availability, which leaves almost 12%. And then on the following slide, uh, same data only broken down by city and township. And again, um, on the left is the 25 three speeds, um, and on the right is the 100 by 20. Yes, so the red is the lower areas, um, uh, and then, yeah, so read it that way. And same on the other side with the yellow. Thank you. All right, so now I want to jump into our broadband program. So here are the programs we currently administer through our office. Uh, most of us know the Border to Border Broadband Infrastructure Program. And as I stated, we have two new programs, a lower population density pilot program that is in with our Border to Border Broadband Program. We also have the line extension program. And as I had mentioned, we are working on our digital equity and um, we do have the telecommuter forward certificate program. And as always, we wanna leverage as much and maximize as much as we can with our federal programs as well. On the next slide, um, just you know, the purpose and, and the reason why the Border to Border Grant Program was, was created was really to find um, a way to meet the financial needs of our providers to reach uh, areas in our state um, and maximize the infrastructure using federal and state funding um, and also get to the speeds that are needed in, um, in our state. Um, and just a reminder, allowable expenses um, are included and listed above, um, but for every project, um, we do have the project designs, the construction, um, the labor, et cetera. 
In the next slide, it talks about who is eligible to apply for these border to border dollars. Um, and so just want to make note that as we are looking and reviewing all of our applications, we, we do take a really deep dive, dive in all of those areas and also recognize geographic uh, areas as well. All right, the next slide, um, a little bit more on the sort of the grant overview. So in the past eight years, we have six years of appropriations going into the program. Uh, during each of those times, we have offered a competitive grant program. And we always um, look at technology that is scalable um, to the speeds to meet our goals um, at, and also the 100 up and 100 down. Each of those uh, grants awards are ten million or five million dollars, excuse me, and we do require the fifty percent eligible expenses match, and that can come from other uh, entities and also our providers who are doing those the work. Um, I think you can move on on that. All right, the next slide I just want to share is just some general updates. Again, um, in December, on December 8th, we did just announce almost $100 million in grant funds. Um, and of that, that is uh, showing the breakdown of where those funds came from, $25 million from the general revenue, as well as our federal partner um, with the $70 million. Um, this is the single largest investment in broadband in one uh, grant round um, and uh, really excited that uh, with all of this dollar and all of these grants that about thir over 33,000 homes and businesses will be receiving broadband. The next slide I just want to talk about is um, prior to this ex the, the round that I just uh, talked about. Um, in the past six years prior to this recent one, um, a little over $126 million has been allocated and, and uh, into different grants. Um, we have received over 360 grant applications and we've made over 179 grant awards during that time period. And you can see the additional data that is listed there. Um, and also the map is really great to show where those locations of the grants are. And again, I know it's hard to see um, up on the screen, but it is, uh, shows it based on year as well. The next slide um, kind of gives uh, the last two grant rounds. So if we're focusing on the 2022, you can see a little over $99 million, 130 uh, applications. Of that, we made 61 awards, the amount of um, areas served. And then also a nice thing to note is the matching fund investments and knowing that we are uh, partnering with uh, our uh, providers and communities across the state to make this happen. All right, um, and then I did talk a little bit about this, but just so you know, uh, again, to highlight that we do have our 2023 grant round that is currently open. Uh, within that, there's uh, $67 million in funding available in the Border to Border traditional program. Um, and again, that program is a 50% uh, cap up to, or a 50% match up to a cap of $5 million per project. Um, and then sharing that $30 million within this program is designated to our low density pilot program. Um, the low density pilot program is really because we know that those last areas to serve are, are most expensive and really listened to our partners and our providers um, and, the, and made this happen. Um, so this is actually a 75% uh, match with a cap of $10 million per project. It's the same application as our border to border grant program. However, there are some additional questions to justify the higher costs needed and also uh, the density in which um, they are um, meeting the goals per mile. So if there is say, uh, for example, one uh, pass per mile, then maybe they would get you know, the maximum additional points and so on as they add passes per mile. So really targeting um, those uh, low areas. And we hope to do some uh, grant award announcements in, in the summer of this year. All right, so the line extension program is also a new program and there's $15 million in this program. 
Um, this is really to help people uh, register in unserved areas. Um, we have a portal on our website and people can also call and they can also send in paper applications as well and we have been processing those. Um, I just want to share a quick story of why this is so important. Um, we had one uh, family call us in May of 2020 and share that they had two uh, people working from home, two students going to school. They could see the line from the road. There it was. And however, um, to get it from their home to their door was over $2,000, and that just wasn't feasible to, for them. So this program is an opportunity to really reach and help all people um, get that last little bit and get it to their home, and it's not quite so far away. There is more information on here about sort of how it works, um, but there will be a 60-day reverse auction. Um, we're reviewing applications every six months, so we'll continue to do that till the money is spent. Um, and uh, already uh, we have, um, or excuse me, it's capped at uh, $25,000 per location, um, and so we're hoping around six uh, 100 applications will be, or people will be able to serve homes. All right, the next program I'll just share a little bit about is our telecommuter, telecommuter forward certificate program. There is no financial um, pieces in there. Really, it is to provide technical assistance to communities across the state um, to really promote telecommuting and all that means. So we provide models, um, templates, technical assistance, instructions, and work with communities across the state um, who are interested in this program. I just wanted to share a little bit about that. Okay, so with that, I'm going to sort of transition to some of our federal opportunities. And the first one being through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, and so this is, um, the federal government is making about $65 billion available national, nationally um, for broadband. Within that, there are two programs, and Minnesota um, has approved uh, uh, grant agreements for both of them. The first one is our BEAD program, um, which is the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment. So if you hear me say BEAD, that's kind of the infrastructure part of this. Um, and so uh, we have already been told um, through the FCC that we will be getting $100 million to go towards the infrastructure. However, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. It does vary based on the FCC mapping that we're currently also working on. So I'll go into sort of a little bit more details in the next slide. Um, and then the other piece, which I'm really excited about, is the digital equity program piece as well. So we are currently working on our digital equity plan as well for the state. Um, and. Uh, looking at ways that we can, you know, sort of develop not only the infrastructure, but what it takes to utilize the infrastructure as best we can. Um, and so there is a lot more information on both of those programs on our website, um, but happy to talk more as well. In the next slide, um, as I was alluding to, the FCC mapping. So the challenge piece right now is happening. Um, those mapping challenges, which are tied to our funding, um, the deadline is actually January 13th, so very soon and tomorrow. Um, but just know that um, the Office of Broadband has done um, as best we can with the time frame that they gave us, which is very short, uh, to work with our mapping vendors and internally um, with um, our our mapping within our um, department uh, to do some challenges of our own. We've also encouraged uh, our associations, uh, our counties, our cities, our townships, and also put a letter to the editor in local papers to encourage individual homeowners and businesses to challenge the map on the accuracy of their availability speed, as well as um, we're doing the fabric mapping as well. So those maps that um, the FCC are using will determine sort of the funding of which we will receive in that bead funding. So the base funding is $100 million. However, determining whatever comes out of these maps um, will also go into the formula of which the funding will receive um, through the IIJA. Um, and then 
The infrastructure piece, again, the bead plan that we're working on has to be submitted uh, by J July 12, 2023, which I'm happy to report Minnesota, because we have a robust broadband program in existence, um, we are confident that we can put a very uh, high level plan together by that date um, and then implement it within the next five years. The next slide talks a little bit about our digital equity plan. So as I have stated, this piece really uh, talks about inclusive ecosystems of digital world and making sure that everybody has the tools they need to thrive um, in Minnesota here. And so with that, we have um, been working on community engagement across the state. We've hired a digital equity lead within our office. Um, we're working on hiring a community engagement and project management coordinator. And all of this work is being in line with our BEAD program and our planning there as well. This particular plan um, goes, we have until November 30th of 2023 to put our plan together. Um, and then um, we will also have a 30-day draft uh, period for public comment. So uh, looking forward to putting all of that together uh, and seeing sort of where that goes within our office and, and continuing that work on long after that period. Uh, with that, I have to make a plug. Part of our planning process with NTIA is to do Internet for All uh, kickoff meeting. And so up here is the date of our meeting, where it's located, and why we're doing it, um, and our partners. And I, I just want to make sure to say we are really pleased with the partners who have stepped up to um, make this a priority in our state. Um, and then also just make sure that um, this, this event is free, it's open to everyone, and we hope anybody in the housing, in veteran services, in healthcare, residents, all, um, anybody that is interested attend our event, and it is also, a virtual option is also available. All right, so um, as I had stated earlier, we do wanna maximize other federal programs that are available. I won't go into a lot of detail, but just want to make sure you're aware that the Affordable Connectivity Program is still out there. It helps assist um, households with their monthly uh, broadband expenses. This is an FCC program as well, um, and uh, people go and register themselves. The next program is the Reconnect program, which a lot of you probably know uh, ran through uh, the Department of Ag, the Federal Department of Ag Rural Development um, as well. And so Minnesota has been part of that program. And um, yeah, I guess we've, you know, we in Minnesota have taken advantage of that program and tried to leverage that through our different communities. All right, the next one is the Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program. And again, Minnesota uh, has been uh, active in looking for those grant opportunities and has done well. And then enabling the Middle Mile Broadband Infrastructure Program is also an NTIA administered program. And um, awards for this particular program come out in March of 2023. So we'll be looking to see how Minnesota does in that area. And finally, um, the Real Digital Opportunity Fund, which we affectionately call ARDOF. Um, this is very, I know, complicated program, um, but uh, just know, uh, happy to get more information to you if you're not familiar with it. Um, but really, it's the you know reverse auction, um, making sure that the Real Digital Opportunity Fund is used well. Um, we're here to be resources um, to all of our communities that are interested in those programs. All right, and with that, I hope I didn't go too fast, um, but here's some more information where you can reach us in our office, where you can reach me, and I'm certainly happy to take any follow-up questions you may have right now. Thank you, Ms. Mackey, for being so thorough and so efficient at the same time. Uh, and also thank you for meeting with me a couple weeks ago to talk about some of this stuff. And one of the things that you brought up in our prior conversation that is clear in uh, your presentation today is that there are different buckets of funding that are going towards solving our broadband problem. And something that I, I believe I learned from you was that federal dollars have different requirements for when they can be spent and how they can be spent. Would you mind explaining that a little bit? Because I think that there's a, that there's a potential for a perception that we're getting all this federal money so the state has less responsibility. Uh, 
Uh, and my understanding from talking with you is that because of distinctions in how federal and state dollars are spent, that's actually a reason for a greater and more robust investment from the state to make sure that broadband uh, coverage reaches everyone. Could you explain uh, that a little bit for us, please, if you wouldn't mind, Ms. Mackey? Sure, thank you, Senator. Um, I would just like to point out that, um, yes, so for instance, in the IIJ funding and the BEAD funding, that particular program for infrastructure could go up to 75% cost share on the federal piece. And then um, at the state level, our traditional border to border program is at 50% cost share. Um, and so there um, certainly we are leveraging funding, funding, but there are opportunities at a state level to maybe make some adjustments, which I think we also have done in the low density pilot program, as well as the line extension looking at what we currently have and what we offer, and then what is left to be served and how we can do that effectively with our providers um, to be able to really get to those last areas that are the most expensive. Um, some of the other programs, um, you're absolutely right, that they need to leverage um, state funding and state resources in order to get here um, as well. And so each program is very complicated. Um, which we all know and expect, and has different rules. Um, and so I apologize if I don't know every single program and where it is at, but it is very fluid and it is something that our office takes a look at to make sure that we are maximizing our federal uh, resources with our state resources. Thank you, Ms. Mackey. Uh, questions from members, Senator Kunish. Thank you for this um, in, uh, review on all of these. Would you explain what these auctions are? When you, when you refer to auction, what is that? Ms. Mackey? Yes, thank you, Senator, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I think when, we, when I talk about that, what I'd like to do is go back uh, to, actually, one, um, the art off. We can put the art off up there, which is the federal program, but I kind of want to talk a little bit about the low density pilot program and how that is going to work. Um, so, um, or, yeah, yes, not the low density, I'm sorry, the line extension. So when a, a person makes their registration on the, the website, and we'll review those every six months, we're going to have a list and we're going to go out to all of our providers that state in the area um, where the service is being requested or saying that they don't have and asking them to validate whether or not those services, um, those speeds, the accessibility is really truly where it is being registered for or if they can get it there. If they can't or do not have a desire to, then it would go up for a reverse auction where other providers could come in and say we can get it done. Um, and so that's the that is sort of the approach we're taking within that program. Um, when it comes to the art off, that's really complicated. It's very similar because if a, it sort of is the current provider has it, but if they can't do it and can't validate they're doing it, then it goes into that reverse and then opens it up for others that may have an opportunity to get the service where people need it if it can't be done. Follow up? Yeah. Senator Kunish? So does that mean that if one provider lays all the, all the materials that they need and all the connectivity, the next, and they, then they say, oh, I, we can't provide the adequate service, does the next provider that maybe purchases that auction and wins the auction, then do they have to come in and lay their own um, material as well? Or do they have access to those same so those same, and I don't know the, the you know, the lingo for the, the cables or whatever it is. Ms. Mack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, this is where it gets really complicated, and I apologize um, that I am probably not going to explain this as best I can. So our hope with the line extension portion of this program that if you can see it and it's right there that those providers would now have a financial incentive because they can apply for up to the $25,000 um, to be able to get that line to the door that they would have the first opportunity and want to do that. Um, 
I know that providers often work together, especially with our cooperatives, um, but I can't answer for them if they would be willing and how they would get that done if they choose not to. Thank you. And I do Senator have Krish. one more question. Senator Krish. Um, uh, when on uh, the slide, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, when you talk about digital uh, equity programs, are those just for households or businesses, or um, are those also for extent, uh, education, schools, universities, libraries, or is this, are we just talking about um, uh, like businesses and economic things? Ms. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, so the digital equity plan in my mind and as we are working through our office and as we do our kickoff meeting really brings everybody together. And it is an opportunity for the state of Minnesota to create whatever digital equity we see as important. And that's why it's so important that we make sure it gets out there widely um, to all types of organizations and individuals. It, in this particular grant round, it is for we receive funding for the actual planning portion. Mm. We are working on a grant, small, like micro grants, non-competitive grants within the dollar amount. Um, I believe it's around, it's a, it's a little under a million dollars for all of this work. Um, but for organizations who are maybe financially, it's not feasible to be as invested in the digital equity plan to have micro plans so that they can designate staff and resources with um, the help of our office to be part of that process because we don't want anybody not to participate because they don't have the staff resources or financial resources to drive into meetings and participate in events for the short window of time where we're doing the planning. It is my also understanding with the bead funding, whatever funding we do not use and whatever is within our plan that doesn't go to infrastructure, we can utilize that for digital equity work as well. So at this point, because we're still in the planning process, I am not sure what is gonna come out based on the Minnesota needs <laughs> and desires in our digital equity, and really it isn't our, my plan or NTIA's plan, it's Minnesota's plan. And so I'm really excited to see what comes out of that. And then that will help kind of guide our work and hopefully all of your work in the next step of digital equity in Minnesota. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Any further follow-up, Senator Knesh? Okay. Senator Dames, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Director Mackey. Just a question for you. The, uh, the match grants where we can get up to $5 million that are out in rural Minnesota, and then there'd be a $5 million match. So typically that $5 million match, where would that come from? Would that come from the provider that is going to be receiving the grant? Would that be the logical place, or would it come from communities? Where would that come from? Ms. Mackey? All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator. So yes, it would, could come from a lot of different sources. Um, it could come from local communities, and we've seen that, especially after the pandemic, that counties or cities have allocated some of their federal resources in, in order to do match dollars. It also comes from the providers who are doing the work as well. Um, and so it really depends on the community and where they have put broadband as their priority and the needs in the community to gather that match dollar. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Could you tell me where you think the majority of the match is coming from, providers or communities? Ms. Mackey. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, in my just uh, short period of time, again, I have heard from a lot of communities as well as providers that are really partnering together and leveraging that federal dollar amounts from our counties um, pandemic funding, city pandemic funding to help bridge those gaps where the providers um, don't have either the resources or need that financial boost um, and want to partner together. Senator, thank you. Thank you. Members, any further questions? Ms. Mackey? Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Anderson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know that there's many different areas throughout the state that are still looking for help in the broadband area, but I'm looking at 
my area of Wright County, where there are areas within the county. Uh, it shows on the map here that we're pretty well taken care of, and yet I get complaints from people within my immediate uh, Senate district saying, we can't even dial, get dial-up. So I'm just wondering, uh, we're looking at giving all these grants to these other places where they don't have very much. What about finishing? Finishing out these places that, according to the map, are complete. Uh, what's, what's the uh, proposal there? Ms. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator. So that's a really great point, and I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, and I probably should have brought it up when we were talking about the FCC mapping. One of the really important pieces of that mapping is multi-unit dwellings. If a multi-unit dwelling has a, has a resident within there that is, is marked served, then the whole dwelling can be marked served. And so again, the FCC mapping right now is a critical component of making sure that people are going on and checking to see whether they're shown serve and doing those challenges. And also just know our offices takes that um, very serious and it is a digital equity piece uh, that we're taking a look at. Also why we are really targeting and working with our uh, housing authorities and making sure that they are aware of our event, having conversations about digital equity and infrastructure in our office. Um, and um, sort of looking beyond the traditional broadband um, areas uh, to meet those goals. So I really appreciate that question. And I think that it does often get missed that in our urban areas, there are also a lot of unserved people. Follow up. Senator, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Mackey, uh, so as you mentioned earlier in your testimony that a lady who couldn't get her line extended uh, because it was $2,000 or something like that. I, I have several, several people like that who are, is there any assistance uh, provided uh, to give, to help complete the build out of broadband in these areas where your map shows it's in initially complete? What about us? Is there any assistance that you provide for a person like that lady that was just saying, I can't afford that $2,000 to get that broadband put in my house? Ms. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, I think that is precisely why the line extension program is so critical and important. Um, and again, uh, the registration for that um, was in the slide with the phone number. I would encourage you to encourage the, your constituents to go on and register. We also at the office are happy to walk through people with registration on that, and that will give us um, a good solid number and also taking you know a thorough look at all of those locations. So that's precisely why this program is in existence. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Any further questions, members? Follow up, Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Senator Anderson. Um, Ms. Mackey, do you have a full staff running your office? Because I hear people who get put on hold and all of a sudden the line goes blank. Do you have a full staff? Ms. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator. We do not. Um, I will just tell you, we, much like every other industry right now, workforce is a challenge. Um, we are working on that. We currently are working on hiring two more grant administrators, which will help us with this uh, incredible amount of uh, funding and grants that we are awarding and looking to award in the future. We're also looking um, for hiring our own um, GIS person, as well as, um, as I talked about in the digital equity role, um, a position there as well. Um, being fairly new to the office myself, um, you know, I'm still uh, filling it out and um, trying to understand where those are needed. So I will say the staff that we have are incredible, hardworking, working extra hours to make sure that these grant came out in a timely manner um, because we want to get the funds out there to people um, and our residents as quickly as we can. But yes, we are challenged with the workforce shortages as well. Senator Anderson, any follow up? Thank you, Ms. Mackey. Any further questions from members? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, uh, to the testifier, you brought up the word digital equity multiple times. Can you explain that more, what, what are you referring to when you keep referring to digital equity? Ms. Mackey. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. When I think of digital equity, it's making sure people not only have the resources, the broadband, the infrastructure to be able to access it, but also the tools and the skills, um, the um, equipment in order to really um, thrive in our broadband economy. Um, and that includes all walks of life. It includes all uh, areas, such as our economic development, um, being able to access state programs, our education systems, our healthcare systems, um, our agriculture, who um, obviously is an important piece of this, um, and making sure all Minnesotans um, have what they need um, in a fair and equitable way. And also, when we talk about access, is it affordable? Senator Western, any follow-up? So, um, Mr. Chair, Ms. Mackey, uh, um, are you saying that the office is expanding their role to make sure people are educated how to use broadband and learn how to use the Internet? Uh, can you explain that a little bit more as, as your previous answer talked about? Ms. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator. So just a reminder, and, and um, on the digital equity piece, this really came out of the IIJA funding. Um, as part of NTIA's um, requirements with our BEAD, it's also to do a digital equity plan. So at this point, I'm not saying that we are um, going to um, you know, do some of these educational programs ourselves per se, but we want to identify within a plan what is needed in Minnesota and how can we as an office best leverage that and work with the organizations who are currently doing that work, understand that work, understand the needs within the scope of their work, and put that in a solid plan that represents the state of Minnesota around digital equity. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, Ms. Mackey, um, getting back to uh, the funding that was passed uh, the, the last year, um, can you give us an update of how much, uh, how many of those dollars are out the door? I know there's been a recent round of uh, proposals and I think even grants and what what is left uh, and, and how how efficient are you able to get that out uh, with the staff shortage you just talked to us about, too? Sure. Mackey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator. Um, I would like to follow up with you on the exact numbers. I don't have those in front of me as far as past grants. We have, I do have the information on the number of applications, the dollar amount requested, um, what was awarded. But as far as um, the completed infrastructure, um, I don't have those in front of me. Um, and so I would like to get back to you on that, if, if that's okay. Senator Western. Mr. Mr. Chair, Ms. Mackey, uh, uh, I'm just looking for maybe bigger, um, bigger, bigger numbers or broader uh, topics. Of the $210 million approved last year, uh, how much of that has been put out as, through RFPs uh, and uh, encumbered or likely to be encumbered? A hundred million of it, uh, 150 million, 20 million, just those numbers is what I'm looking for. Just, just in those categories. And we also gave you uh, some additional um, pilot projects or uh, dollars to, to do some work on mapping as well as uh, innovative uh, uh, options for some of the last. Uh, hard to serve last mile uh, extensions that you were talking about. So just those categories, how much of those dollars are are uh, in RFPs uh, roughly and, and how many uh, dollars are left and maybe a timeline and when the rest will be put out and, and coupled with your staffing shortages, uh, what's, is that holding you up on some of those proposals and getting them out the door? Ms. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator. So um, broadly speaking, um, I will say in December, we did award 90, over $99 million in uh, grant applications uh, for over 33,000 homes and businesses across the state of Minnesota. So those awards are out. Our office are working on them right now, getting all of the contracts signed uh, with the grant uh, awardees, and we hope construction will start as soon as, as, soon as the ground uh, 
defrost. Um, as well as just noting that the 67 million in the current grant round is up um, on our website, and I believe the application period will close on that March 2nd. So those are the two most current ones. Um, in uh, 2020, we had over $20 million um, in grant awards um, going out the door with 64 applications received. Um, and so those are kind of the highlights of the last few years of where we're at. Again, um, just based on uh, previous years, I'm not exactly sure how many have been fully constructed and out the door, but I will just note the last two that I were talking about, you know, are fairly new um, and our staff are working really diligently with all of our providers to get those contracts in place so that uh, construction can start as soon as possible. We hope on the, the most recent round that we will be making those grant announcements in early summer. Thank you, Ms. Mackey. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Mackey, to the staffing question that I asked, uh, are, are some of those things getting delayed because of your staff shortage? Uh, Senator Anderson talked about constituents uh, calling in and not being able to get somebody to answer the phone or their phone gets dropped after they're put on hold. Um, how much uh, how much of this is getting delayed because of staff shortages and uh, shortages in your office uh, with the ability to get the work done? Ms. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator. Um, this is certainly a priority for, for myself as a new leader in this office, as well as the office. Um, the grant administrator positions that I had talked about earlier, um, we are working on finalizing um, the applicants and um, uh, doing some hiring there, which will really help ease some of those delays in the current grants that we have and help administer them as we move forward into the summer months. Um, and again, the other two programs, uh, or other two positions um, are certainly high priority for me. Um, our staff of six, again, um, with the dollar amounts, the amount of grants, the work that we do, we are highly uh, efficient and highly effective. Um, I believe that my staff is well trusted with our providers and the communities that we serve. We understand your concerns, we have them too, um, and we're working incredibly hard uh, to meet those needs. And Mr. Chair, Senator final, Westrom. final question. Um, Ms. Mackey, um, I get a little concerned when I hear uh, the, the broadened definition of your digital equity and then at the same tone, time where the, the purpose and the mission of the office is to deploy the rural broadband uh, program and the infrastructure to have the backbone put in. And I guess I'm a little concerned hearing from you talking about the purpose of uh, turning your office into an education uh, of people using it, um, using the internet, uh, that should really be the focus of our education system. And I just hope we aren't getting losing our uh, mission and the purpose of the Office of Broadband, which uh, was set up to actually uh, have an end date uh, coming you know, this decade potentially because we could have the broadband built out and the infrastructure in place. And so um, I'm a little concerned about the staff shortages and the priorities of getting out the main thing, staying the main thing, which is building the, the broadband uh, infrastructure and backbone across the, the, the state. And so uh, can you comment on that? How, do you, how are you going to put these priorities at a higher level? Uh, because it, turning, turning your office into an education uh, system uh, so users uh, know how to use the internet or the broadband, I, I just think is, is way beyond what your office was ever set up to do. Ms. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, um, so just to reiterate, again, the digital equity piece is a federal program, and it is partnered with the BEAD program, which is infrastructure. Um, so those two have to align and work together in order to leverage the maximum federal resources we can with the infrastructure piece. Um, again, if I didn't make this clear, our certainly our job is to help develop the digital equity plan and bring all those partners that uh, you talked about that are in our education, um, in our workforce, in um, our 
our health care uh, together to have a conversation around what digital equity means to them. I certainly don't think any one of us want to take over a role that other agencies are already doing and other groups. But I do think that there is an opportunity to work together to leverage all the resources that are available in order to make sure that the infrastructure continues to happen and the whys that it needs to happen are part of the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. Members, any further questions? Thank you, Ms. Mackey and Ms. Dannon, for your thorough presentation and your excellent and insightful answers to our questions. Thank you. Uh, next up. Uh, we will hear a presentation by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture uh, with Commissioner Peterson and uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Volvo. If you would uh, please come to the table, uh, state your full name for the record, and commence your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is uh, Tom Peterson. I serve as uh, Commissioner of the uh, Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And uh, I have with me today uh, Deputy Commissioner Andrea Vobel. And, uh, and if I could just a minute, just introduce our other commissioners since uh, you'll be working with them quite a bit. We have, uh, I just have to check here, we have uh, Commissioner Peter Chesset uh, and uh, Commissioner Patrice Bailey and uh, Michelle Medina, who is our government re 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 relations rep and my assistant, uh, and again, said, who also helps us with our legislative uh, issues. So I just want you to know to feel free to reach out to any of us. We'll uh, discuss, too, the commissioners uh, take different uh, sections or things that they oversee uh, within the department. So with that, I'll just jump right in and We'll uh, go right through the uh, different uh, presentations here. So real quick, just uh, for the members uh, uh, that have been continuing on the committee and the new members on the committee, just a quick snapshot of Minnesota agriculture. Uh, we have 67,400 farms in Minnesota. You think about that with a population of 5.7 million people. You also think about what is a farmer in our state, what, is, what makes you a 67,000. That's just somebody who has 1,000 uh, dollars worth of annual gross income or more. So I could sell a couple of goats, a horse, and a load of hay. I could get to that $1,000. So we have a lot of farmers that really uh, span the spectrum of that uh, dollar amount. Our goal is always to keep the farmers we have and add new farmers. Average size of a farm is 377 acres across the state. Really varies. Uh, and you can see uh, or understand the numbers there. Uh, you know, looking at the, the money that those farms uh, generate across our state. The one thing I'd highlight there is the, uh, <clears throat> the real nice balance Minnesota has between our crop and livestock sectors. Uh, that It's up a little bit this year with the crop sector, but usually it's almost the same, or it, it uh, balances out really nice, which is very helpful. Uh, let's see. Okay. And uh, just kind of some of the things where we rank, uh, number one, of course, in uh, turkeys, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, you know, kind of in uh, uh, Stearns County and out into the west part of, uh, up into Senator uh, uh, Westrom's district. Uh, and, and of course, number one in sugar beets up in uh, uh, Senator Kupek's district and north there. And then number two in hogs, uh, which is a very high volume, high dollar. Uh, and dry beans is something we've been really uh, raising as we, uh, or, or the numbers as we, uh, good to see growth there. And then also corn soybeans, very popular. And I would mention today is National Milk Day. So I have to mention that we rate uh, number seven in dairy cows in the state. We have, uh, we'll go into that a little more too here. Uh, next too, just looking at some of the main uh, trends and challenges we've had in agriculture across the state. Uh, again, uh, drought is something that we uh, have really uh, challenged us a lot with in 2021. Uh, we did the drought payments the committee did in 2022 for the 2021 drought. Uh, and uh, we did have a, a continuing drought in 2022. Uh, the drought in 2022 is a little different because it, it started uh, uh, kind of in the fall and uh, our corn and soybean, our crops had kind of been made uh, at that point. And so it actually in some cases helped dry the crop down quickly. Um, but it did create a lot of uh, concerns about going into this next year. 
And, uh, you know, it, we did use up a lot of our fall hay and our fall uh, pasture. And so that was uh, challenging for some farmers. So we'll see how we go into next year now with a lot of the snow we have. We use the drought monitor, which comes out every Thursday. You can see the current map. Uh, and, well, that's a couple weeks ago, but it's, it continues to improve very slowly uh, and, uh, as we go forward, but something that we'll continue to have discussions about. Avian influenza is another big issue that we dealt with a lot uh, last year. Appreciate the uh, leadership and help and support we had from Senator Westrom and the whole uh, Senate at that point. Uh, we were able to get an appropriation uh, to help us deal with that around Easter time last year of a million dollars and then more dollars uh, in our budget last year, but uh, we continue to have avian influenza outbreak. Uh, the last cases we had were just before Christmas, but you can see there are 110 affected farm sites, and those are both larger commercial, but also backyard uh, flocks. And backyard flocks, we can say, you know, those can be really important. A lot of uh, locally uh, smaller producers that sell local to farmers markets and things like that can be very devastating to your operation, whether you're big or small. Uh, emerging farmers and land access, another uh, piece that uh, we're really looking at as an agency. Uh, we had a rural finance authority meeting today just with the uh, silver uh, tsunami, baby boomers, everything. It's just like everything else. Uh, uh, we have farmers who are retiring in record numbers. We uh, extension, I think they anticipate that 50% of the farmland in Minnesota is going to change hands in the next 20 years. So we have great programs. We have our Rural Finance Authority. We have our Beginning Farmer Tax Credit. Uh, and we have our uh, Down Payment Assistance Program. Uh, so, uh, but just how we uh, work on that and at the same time bring new farmers into the fold is a very important thing. And then I won't spend a lot of time on that, but input costs just like any other business, fertilizer, seed, labor, trucking, etc. Big cost. There's our mission for the department uh, and uh, just to enhance the Minnesotans quality of life uh, uh, by equitably ensuring the integrity of our food supply, the health of our environment, strength and resilience of our agriculture economy. A uh, little bit of an overview of the department too. We have about 515 employees at the peak. Every year we have a lot of seasonal employees too. Uh, that includes, uh, might be uh, people that help us with our potato harvest and inspections, uh, emerald ash borer, uh, spongy moth, uh, different things like that. Uh, uh, some of the things we do, we promote farm products uh, in the local, state, national, and international markets. We respond to disease and pests that threaten our agriculture and natural resources. We also inspect grocery stores and convenience stores, as well as dairy farms and processing plants and feed mills and fertilizer plants. Some of the main responsibilities, uh, just uh, we're, we're we're in charge of protecting our food supply, keeping our food safe uh, is just uh, kind of what it gets down to. We're a key player in working with our other state agencies, the state agencies uh, for protecting our state's national resource, natural resources. And we are a primary agency for supporting and promoting ag. I look at us as, as a chief cheerleader for all of uh, agriculture in the state of Minnesota. And uh, we'll be uh, talking today about our, our divisions that we have real quickly. Those are our main divisions, ag marketing, dairy and meat inspection, food and feed safety, lab services, pesticide and fertilizer management, plant protection, and the Rural Finance Authority. Mr. Chair, uh, for the record, my name is Andrea Vobel. I serve as Deputy Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Ag, and I'm just gonna do a few slides here uh, and tag team it with the Commissioner. So um, uh, Mr. Olson did a great job of going over this on Monday, but just a, a quick overview for fiscal year 22 and 23, just an overview of our funding sources by use and budget activity. Uh, so you'll see for protection services, about 55% of that goes uh, into our, our protection services, which covers our pesticide and fertilizer management division, plant protection, our lab, food and feed safety, and dairy and meat. 34% of our, our budget activity goes to promotion, which is 34% ag marketing and development, ag advancement programs and grants and assistance. And then 11% goes into our agency services for, for administration. For our funding sources by uh, expenditures by funds, so you'll see in, uh, we have $4.6 million in remediation funding, which is about 2%. Uh, 32.5 million in legacy dollars come to us, 36.4 million in federal funding, which equates to 13% of our, our total expenditures. Uh, 110.5 million in general fund, which equates to 38%. And then 103.6 million in fees paid by customers, or as, as uh, we commonly know it, dedicated fund or our ag fund and special revenue is 36%. 
Okay, and we'll go into our, our first division. What we'll talk about is our ag marketing and development. It's probably my favorite uh, uh, division. It's uh, what we do to help promote all of our agricultural products across the state. We've done a lot of work on this uh, in the last few years. Uh, so focusing on how we uh, strengthen, resilient, make our food system resilient, that really played out in COVID, you know, because you think about COVID, besides toilet paper, everybody worried about their food in the grocery stores and what we were going to get provided a lot of opportunities for us. And so just a lot of good things that uh, come through that division. Uh, it's a non-regulatory division. Uh, it's a purely a market development promotion. They work on things like uh, biofuels, renewable chemicals. Those are things the committee will deal with. That's an interesting uh, piece of that. We deal with ag land preservation. So if you get into some of the uh, areas around like uh, the, um, the seven county metro area, uh, we do have ag land preservation laws, which are really important if you're in, uh, even in Center Gustafson Center, Center Seaburgers district, where you have those uh, those tracts of farmland that farmers want to uh, uh, maintain and support, they can get different credits and programs. Well, we'd like to update some of those programs, and so we're working on that uh, as well. Egg literacy is uh, our farm to school programs are very important to us, uh, and then farm safety is something this committee has worked on uh, uh, over the years. Uh, farm safety is something we've made a priority. Uh, we, I've worked in the legislature for a long time, and farm safety. A lot of times we react to uh, bad things that happen. And so I, we've tried to keep the ball up in the air. We have uh, quarterly meetings with farm groups. Legislators are in, invited to uh, join us, but that way we're constantly talking about it. The farm, uh, we've also had farm safety grants, which have been very important. And then, our, um, uh, and then we do special projects like the drought relief or the aquaculture. I just say the drought relief, uh, for example, you can go to the next slide. The drought relief, for example, we did 3,000, almost 3,000 payments last year in a short amount of time. Uh, and that was this division that worked hard to get those, verify the claims, and then get those out. We do, you're going to hear a lot about the Agri program. I, it's about 25% of our general fund budget, which is really an important part. This Agri program was uh, originally an ethanol uh, producer payments that helped create our ethanol industry in the state. Back before in my previous job, we looked at that and we said that at that time was 40% of MDA's budget. And those, uh, were, uh, those payments were going to end and go away. The legislature at that time worked to keep that money in the ag budget because the ag budget is about about one half of one percent of the state's entire budget so when we looked at that at that time it was even less and if we would have lost 40 percent of that you know when we look at ag and everything it plays into it so i just want to say it's a really important program uh, the value added grants you heard from tom smoothie the other day uh, he for example used agri and and uh uh, and a value-added grant to uh, further his business. So we do a lot of uh, those type of things uh, with that. We also have things like our Minnesota Grown Program, our uh, Biodiesel Task Force, Organic Advisory Task Force, and, and other things within that. And then trade shows, uh, uh, um, our Minnesota Grown, which many of you may be familiar with, and then work with uh, restaurants, grocers to uh, help promote Minnesota companies. Then next, our dairy and meat inspection. Just a little bit about our dairy uh, industry in Minnesota. It's been a challenge as commissioner as it has been around the whole country. Uh, Mr. Chair, you represent Stearns County, the number one dairy county in the state. Uh, Senator Westrom's had part of that before. Uh, I always say the hardest thing I open every month is our dairy report, and we look at those uh, declining uh, dairy numbers across the uh, across Minnesota. We just went under 2,000 dairy farms for the first time. Uh, and uh, you know we've looked at a lot of different things that we can do for our dairy farmers, but we are responsible uh, for our inspections and ensuring that uh, um, this is a regulated uh, division. So our milk inspections and responding to emergencies and outbreaks are very important for that. Uh, we collect samples, monitor product safety, conduct outreach, educational activities, work with a lot of those farmers. We have some big co-ops in, uh, in the state, which we're really proud of, whether it's AMPI or First District, Land O'Lakes. Uh, so a very important part of our uh, industry. Uh, and uh, we also issue certificates to dairy and meat companies so they can sell their products internationally. 
And I'll just go into another one of our regulatory divisions, the Food and Feed Safety Division. Uh, so they are in charge of ensuring the safety of the food supply through work with produce growers and human and animal food manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. Uh, they do a, a whole host of things, including maintaining inventories of regulated human and animal food operations, conduct assessments to regulatory standards for human and animal food products and handling activities. We also enforce regulatory requirements by ensuring all the safety violations are corrected and respond to food-related emergencies and outbreaks similar to the, the Dairy and Meat Inspection Division. Um, we do conduct pre-operational reviews of facilities, so before they get into operation, um, and operational plans to provide guidance on how to meet the regulatory requirements provided by law. Um, we also administer the commercial feed licensing and product listing, food handlers licensing, and then our cottage food producer registration, which I'm sure this committee has heard a lot about and will continue to hear about. Um, the cottage, just on a side note, the cottage food producer um, community has grown quite exponentially over the years. We are over uh, 7,000 certifications for, um, for, for cottage food producers, and we expect that to, to grow in the coming years. Uh, we use risk-based risk inspections to ensure sanitary environments for all safe food handling practices. Um, we collect samples to monitor product safety, issue notices of violation, and uh, other enforcement actions as needed. Um, we also do administer the Governor's Food Safety and Defense Task Force, which was uh, integral in a lot of the COVID response for, for food safety um, during the outbreak. And we also issue export certificates. Um, so again, these, these uh, items can be sold internationally. I'll also go into our laboratory. Uh, we have a very uh, a world-class lab that we're very proud of, again, uh, with these, these, uh, these folks, along with Food and Feed Safety, Dairy and Meat, and then some of the other uh, folks that we'll get into with some other divisions, all of these folks uh, continued to come to work during the COVID outbreak to make sure that we could maintain um, a, a safe food supply for, for Minnesotans. Um, so we're very grateful that uh, during all of that unrest, they were, they were uh, in, in uncertainty, they, they came in each day. Um, so they assist in the regulatory enforcement and monitoring activities of all things we do at MDA, along with our federal partners. Again, they're really integral in any response to outbreaks and emergencies related to, to food in particular. Um, support the protection of the environment through our work with MDA and sister agencies like DNR uh, as well as the EPA. And um, we also support the protection of the ag industry by providing accurate data on which action can be taken or responsibility can be determined. We provide microbi microbiological, chemical, physical, and pesticide testing for MDA, again, other sister agencies. Um, we are uh, very data-driven um, and make sure it's legally and scientifically defensible. We provide analytical services for things like chemical spills and foodborne outbreaks and other, I other things. And again, um, we work with the FDA, USDA, and EPA through cooperative agreement programs. Okay, next one of the uh, very important divisions that this committee works with and uh, that the department oversees is our Pesticide and Fertilizer Management Committee. Uh, uh, things that we do, pesticide fertilizer regulation, uh, protection from groundwater and chemicals, ag chemicals. Emergency response is uh, very critical and spills and cleanups, I always say is kind of an interesting thing as commissioner. You know, you get uh, calls at uh, midnight or uh, two in the morning where there's accidents and a spill. We have great staff that respond to those, uh, try to keep people safe, keep the chemicals, uh, work with plans to uh, keep them uh, where they need to be. And so, uh, very important piece, waste pesticide collection, another great program the department has. And then our Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certification Program, which is a, a great program I hope the committee looks at a little bit more when we look at progress we're trying to make to address some of these issues. We now have almost a million acres enrolled and 1,300 farmers uh, in that program. Uh, we do this uh, working with the regulated industry, interested parties, and uh, we uh, try to front end as much as we can because uh, uh, we try to educate farmers and applicators, uh, work with the associations to really, uh, uh, you know, make sure that we're uh, doing well. Uh, a lot of these people have to uh, be trained and uh, go through inspections. We employ 110 agronomists, soil scientists, and hydrologists. 40% of them live in greater Minnesota. I'd also point out that a lot of our staff live in greater Minnesota uh, and all over the state because we have inspectors, we have different people, whether they're, again, soil scientists or, or and many of them uh, not only have a farm background, they also still farm or live on farms or involved in their family farms. Uh, we have a $30 million uh, budget a year. A lot of those uh, come from fees that farmers and businesses pay, and then also our clean water fund. This is not a division that gets a lot of general fund dollars. 
I'll go over another uh, part of our, one of our un regulatory divisions called the Plant Protection Division. What they do is protect natural and ag resources from invasive species. Um, some of the other, uh, the, the commissioner mentioned emerald ash borer, um, spongy moth. We also work with the brown marmorated stink bug, which is personally my favorite, uh, amongst others. We protect market access for Minnesota plants and plant products. Uh, we also help facilitate fair and transparent marketplaces. We also have uh, the, the compensation program for producers for help um, when they are, are suffer from wolf depredation or elk damage to crops. And how we do this. So we facilitate detection and management of invasive species, including insects, as I mentioned, EAB and smudgy moth, uh, uh, plant pathogens as well, red star rust. We work with the, um, our, our lab on that a lot, uh, as well as invasive plants. So things like palmer amaranth, I'm sure you're very familiar with. Um, we also inspect production areas to ensure standards are met as plant pest pathogen threshold, thresholds. So we do nursery inspections, uh, we do seed potato uh, inspections. We also um, look at THC limits, so our industrial hemp program is housed in this division. Uh, we also inspect plants, seeds, and other plant products offered for sale. Uh, so we have our seed certification, um, our noxious weed program is out of this division as well. Um, we provide oversight for grain and produce transactions to prevent sellers from not from who are not being paid. Uh, we expect that, that we will have that conversation uh, in this committee at another time with the, the number of grain elevator failures that have happened in the recent past. Um, and again, we verify and then pay the claims for damage to producers uh, who have had uh, damage from wolves or elk. Uh, we also provide grants to prevent uh, damage in the future or to prevent from damage. Uh, also, as the, the commissioner mentioned, the Rural Finance Authority or the RFA, as well as our Ag BMP loan program. Uh, so the RFA administers five bond-funded eight and eight revolving loans and one grant-funded program. Uh, they finance at very low rates and conditions that are not available in the regular marketplace. Uh, this group also administers the beginning farmer tax credit. They administer the down payment assistance grant program that was just, uh, we were just created last year that we just uh, opened up recently and had uh, great success and, and response to. Um, we service over 742 loans for over $100 million. And then our Ag BMP loan ser program services over 4,000 loans and a portfolio of over $87 million. One thing to note about the Ag BMP program is it is a revolving loan program, so that money can be reinvested. How we do this, we have seven amazing staff members who do all of these things. Uh, we work with over 400 community banks and community lenders to provide ag financing. We work with over 1,000 farmers per year to do the beginning farmer tax credit. And then um, Ag BMP works mostly with all the, the counties all over the state and over 360 lending institutions to provide an average of 668 loans per year. And with that, Mr. Chair, that concludes our presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Peterson and, and uh, Deputy Commissioner Vauble. Um, uh, members, due to our uh, protracted floor session experience today uh, and our late uh, start out of respect for time, I'm going to ask us if we have questions that we make them very succinct uh, in respect for the time of our guests here. And also acknowledge that this is not the last time we're going to see uh, Commissioner Peterson and our friends from MDA. Uh, so if you do have questions of immediate relevance, members, do you have questions? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, just a, maybe an interesting note, but a question, uh, Commissioner Peterson, um, in your early comments about 67,000 farmers, uh, but that counts from $1,000 income and, and above. Um, is, that, is that consistent with the policies we have for allowing uh, farmers to receive ag homestead credit as well as farm permit applications for their children when they would become eligible for that. And just as you noted it, I, I know there's times uh, constituents are trying to get either their child with a farm permit or some ag homestead credit on their farm. Um, do you know if we've got consistency with that uh, across the board or, or any thoughts on that? I just struck me as you talked about that, and I thought that we should be consistent um, as well, if we could. Commissioner Peterson. Mr. Chair and Senator, actually I should correct myself. We have 67,400 farms in Minnesota, farm families. So a family, you could have more actual people. And uh, getting into, those are things that we always look at, like with Homestead. Do you qualify, like what qualifies a Homestead? And that really is we have more and more new farmers uh, things like that, uh, in, in, it would be in like Rep Senator, uh, sorry, I always think of you as Representative, Senator Anderson's area or something like that where you do have smaller 
farms or you may have a farm that's 10 acres, you know, that they, they make $50,000 on that 10 acres or they make more than, you know, the $1,000. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, definitions within statute and interpretations. And a lot of times that comes down to the county, you know, on uh, whether it's egg homestead. So you have to file a Schedule F maybe, which is... Uh, the form, uh, you know, for uh, uh, taxes to show that you have income. It really depends. Same with uh, when you go to get a farm license, uh, you, they might ask you for a Schedule F to make sure that you're uh, um, drawing some income. But usually, it's not a uh, threshold. It's it's a Schedule F, or uh, and I can't remember exactly on the homestead. We could look that up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if one of the researchers knows that off the top of their head, but. There is uh, different thresholds, but it's it's pretty good, you know, across the provides opportunities for that. And Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner, it, it seems from my recollection of, of working on some of those issues with constituents over the time that maybe that's a little higher threshold. We've made families uh, meet for either homestead uh, tax treatment for agriculture or uh, being able to get their child a, a farm permit, but. I don't know that for certain, but I it, it just I thought of it as you were talking about it, and uh, it seems like we should work towards including all of those farmers into those uh, benefits or policies that that we allow. And maybe maybe a Ms. Painter knows that offhand. I'm not trying to put you in the spot, but uh, do we do we know what the thresholds are for either farm permits or or um, ag homestead? And if not, that's fine. I'm just while we're talking about it, it's it's worthy to, to, to talk about. Commissioner Peterson. Yeah, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, yeah, we can look at that and see, and uh, uh, we can follow up on that. And I'd, I'd say, like, the $1,000, you know, and I can say this from personal experience, that, you know, some years farming, your income may, you may not have income, you know, or you may have, you know, yeah, and so, uh, or you may have in the negative, uh, you know, so I think it's really interesting when we say, you know, uh, you know, low income or different uh, pieces. And then we're also trying to, you know, always encourage people to get into agriculture. So a lot of those people on that small income end, they have a dream of getting into it full time, but it might be healthcare or something else that's keeping them from really going uh, full time. So, but we can check on that and get back to you. Senator Westrom, any further follow-up? No, Mr. Chair, no, Mr. Chair, unless Ms. Painter happens to know any of those answers offhand and if not, that's fine. Ms. Painter? Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, I do not know that number offhand. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Senator Anderson, I believe you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Peterson, uh, earlier on in your testimony, you talked about emerging farmers uh, and land access. I'm just wondering, it seems like we're losing farmers. You mentioned we've got less than 2,000 dairy farmers now. What is, uh, are there things that the Department of Agriculture can do to incentivize the young farmers or young people? I, I know we have in Wright County, uh, especially in Buffalo, the FFA Alumni Association, who are people from the farm background who get together. We listen to their presentations from the FFA standpoint and help them to want to get involved. And we've gotten more women involved, young girls, uh, just across the board who've gotten excited about uh, taking up. And I, I have a lady who uh, comes from the cities uh, who took on an Ayrshire herd in Wright County uh, and is milking, I think, upwards 65, 60, maybe more uh, Ayrshire cows on her own. Her, her husband is a, a, a computer specialist. She's, he's learning about agriculture, but I mean, I, to me, if we keep losing these farmers uh, and we keep the older generation retires, as you mentioned, uh, is there things that are happening? Uh, you mentioned or later, later in the deal about a, a beginner farmer tax credit. That's one thing. What other, I, I sense when I, my father went out of farming, his reason was that there was too many rules and regulations. <laughs> Every time he turned around, there was another a hurdle that he had, to, and he basically said, I'm done. And so I'm, I'm concerned because of what you've mentioned, uh, we're losing farmers and, and access to land, those older farmers. What, what, what are the incentives are coming forward? 
Commissioner Peterson, as you answer, you might want to brag a little bit about the down payment assistance program and how that was oversubscribed in less than 24 hours, is my understanding. Uh, members, I don't know if you noticed that, but there is a down payment assistance program to do exactly what Senator Anderson is asking for. And I believe it was 28 applicants in the first five minutes, and the whole thing was done within a day and a half because of how successful that program was. So I'm giving you a softball to brag on thank that. You. If you would, please, Mr. Peterson. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Peterson. Chairman and uh, Senator Anderson, thank you, and thank you for the... Uh, the question, and uh, you know, I'm really uh, excited about what what we do as a state. Uh, you know, uh, when we look at what other states offer, Minnesota has a great suite of options, and and we could do more, and we could do uh, uh, several things. And so, I always look at four things our state does that we've worked on this committee in the legislature. Uh, one is the beginning farmer tax credit that passed, I think, in 2017. We do about a thousand transactions a year within the department, the RFA does that, also at no cost at all. So it's something that we have to look at because it is a, that is a um, extreme uh, thing for our, uh, our staff does a great job, but that's a thousand uh, transactions between the asset owner and a young farmer. Um, they get uh, either 5% for uh, uh, buying something or 10% uh, for renting. And uh, there's some wiggle room there and we're gonna have some uh, pieces in that in the tax bill, but it's something our administration uh, registers. I remember when this started, and I thought the fiscal note, they said 400 farmers a year would use this, and I was like, that would be great, you know, if that was true. And we ended up at least about that, somewhere between four and 550 people. But that program is uh, is amazing. I'd also mention with the, within, the, within the Rural Finance Authority, so we have that, and then uh, we have the uh, beginning farmer loan program within the Rural Finance Authority, which is essentially our bank at the Department of Agriculture. Um, uh, by the way, that is something that we want to discuss with the committee because we will are projected to run out of money uh, in October of this year. And so every couple of years we reauthorize uh, bonds, uh, bond sales. And so that's something the legislature has done uh, over the years, this committee. Uh, and so we'll be working on that. But that beginning farmer loan program, we just had a meeting today, by far and large, our uh, biggest loan we do. I think we've done 30 some uh, just in this last quarter uh, to uh, beginning farmers. And then Mr. Chair, as you mentioned, the third thing is our down payment assistance program that uh, uh, was something that passed as part of the Ag Bill last year that is, gives people up to $15,000 to purchase their first farm. Uh, and there's some caveats on that. They have about three months. Uh, that opened, I think, on January 5th, and we closed it on January 7th. As you said, I think we had uh, 20, 30 applicants within the first five minutes. By the end of the day, we were looking at closing it. We capped it at 100 applicants because we, we think we have money for about 30, uh, 33, 34 farms if everybody took the full 15,000. Legislature appropriated $500,000 for this year. $750,000 will be available in fiscal year uh, that starts uh, uh, July 1st. And so we'll have another round then. We may have some proposals or changes for the committee to look at that based on this first round that we want to look at. But it's a great thing, you know, for we lost 100 farmers last year, anything we can do uh, overall. And, and keep in mind, Senator, when people go out of dairy farming, they don't necessarily go out of farming. So they may go into uh, beef farming or crop farming, but it's uh, important as we start to look at this. And then also our farming is changing in our state. We have uh, many Hmong farmers, we have Somali farmers, uh, we have Latino farmers. And so uh, helping those uh, folks get started, uh, access that land has been important. The last thing we have is a farm link program, which we could share with you sometime. You can uh, help update, it does two things. One, it has farms that are for sale across the state where people can go and look at for land and farms. And then it also uh, helps connect uh, farmers with uh, farmers who are aging out. And so they, uh, you know, I visit with a dairy farm, uh, they're in their 60s, early 60s, they have no kids. They put all this life work into the farm. They'd rather not auction it. They'd rather work with somebody to transition it. And so, uh, so again, we have some good suite of things. We'll have some more new ideas for you in our budget proposal, but, uh, always things we could do better, but I'm glad the, the things that we do have. And that's a lot of the work the legislature's done the last few years. Any follow-up, Senator Anderson? Thank you. Any further questions? Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick question about what you just said. What was the name of the website, Farm Link, you said? Okay, quick question. Thank you. 
Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Peterson, uh, the governor might be calling. I'll tell him to wait. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, um, an issue that's come up a lot in the last six to 12 months um, is farmland ownership in Minnesota. And I've had several constituents bring it to my attention. Uh, Farm Fest last summer uh, was a hot topic to talk to farmers about. And uh, it was right in the throes of um, a big chunk of farmland up in, by, in Grand Forks, North Dakota, being bought by Chinese investors or Chinese uh, holders. And um, it's really getting to the question of, do we have adequate laws in place in Minnesota to keep uh, Minnesota real estate uh, an opportunity for Minnesotans and uh, people that want to invest here, live here, and uh, long-term have uh, an invested interest in our state's uh, economy as well as uh, communities. And um, we, we had talked then and uh, made commitments to actually holding some hearings on that this year. Um, and, and I guess I'd just be interested in what you hear about, what do you uh, know about it, and um, is, there, is there some things we should be looking at uh, to uh, make sure that there's a, a good opportunity for land ownership by uh, you know, Minnesotans and, and uh, farmers and uh, people that uh, are interested in that, uh, the flourishing of uh, agriculture, but uh, uh, dealing with the issue of uh, outside or foreign ownership, uh, frankly. And um, what, what do we have for protections in place? So we know we have the corporate farm law, but is it, is it adequate in today's, um, in, in today's world? Commissioner Peterson. Mr. Chairman, Senator Westrom, thanks for asking that because I think it's a misunderstood uh, thing that we're dealing with. And a lot of that has to do with uh, North Dakota, the Chinese, Bill Gates, uh, all of these uh, different things. And I think that Minnesota does have a pretty strong corporate farm law that uh, limits corporations from owning farmland uh, across our state and also uh, uh, foreign ownership uh, as well. And so uh, stronger than, I'd say, the Dakotas, uh, South Dakota uh, for sure, North Dakota, we do have that, you know. But uh, uh, I also remind people, it depends on how it's done, but Bill Gates, uh, for example, buying land. Bill Gates is a citizen. Uh, whether he you like that or not or anything, he's eligible to buy land depending on how he does it. In Minnesota, he would have to follow uh, laws. You can fa do like a family farm LLC. So I'd say we have a ban on, we do allow corporate uh, entities uh, like LLCs to buy land, but that was, those are family farm uh, corporations. Uh, and so we do limit that. Um, we do uh, uh, investigations. Uh, Right now, uh, with the cost of farmland, we do get complaints. We do see land speculators. We do see companies coming into Minnesota that may not know they can't, are not aware of the corporate farm law. So we do encourage people to report those to our office and we'll investigate those uh, and then inform them about what uh, is legal in Minnesota. We review uh, 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 corporate farm. Uh, we do exemptions for LLCs and different types of ownership structure within the state. Uh, and uh, so I, I do think our law is pretty strong. Um, our, our bigger problem that we see, to be honest, is maybe with some of our newer farming structures. So uh, and looking at uh, people that are co-ops that want to buy uh, farmland or people that are buying smaller tracts of land and they kind of want to get together. And so we have to look at how that fits within the corporate farm law. But a lot of people will say we got to stop, you know, Chinese from buying land and and our different uh, entities, not to pick on the Chinese, but that's kind of, to be honest, who I get the most questions about. Um, they can't in Minnesota, you know, and so uh, it does happen, though. People, they acquire land, they do things, they do have time to divest, it depends. 
I think you have uh, one year if it's a, a foreign entity, five years if it's a corporate farm uh, to divest of that land, and we work with them to uh, get that. Either they sell it or we get them into a proper uh, holding. So good question. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner Peterson. Senator Mr. Westrom, do you have a follow-up? Mr. Chair, Commissioner, um, to your point, um, what, what do we have in place that oversees it? I know there's a division in, in the Department of Ag that uh, deals with some of the f corporate farm laws and the land ownership, uh, but to your latter point, uh, it sounds like if things are, are as they're found, they, there is times where they divest or have to divest. Um, how, do, how do we unwind those transactions if they go through? And um, some are probably a little more complicated, some probably fly below the radar. Uh, are there transactions that have gone through and years later probably still exist? Um, I'll let you answer that and then one more comment, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Peterson. Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, uh, yes, we have a great legal counsel that uh, he's been with us for 25 years maybe or more. And uh, he, he's, uh, we don't have a big legal team uh, at the department. We have two uh, legal counsel, but we have one that works on this. Uh, and uh, he's very uh, knowledgeable on this. We also work with the Attorney General's office on it, so uh, that uh, he is the person that uh, uh, works with all of that. He sends the letters, notices, uh, things like that. Investigate. So Thank you for answering, Mr. Peterson. Uh, Mr. Mr. Peterson, uh, Senator Westrom, your final Mr. comment? Mr. Chair, um, just, just as we talk about this topic, um, as I mentioned, it, it, was a, it was a topic on the list of topics that uh, I had worked with staff to uh, start thinking about um, for an ag hearing and I guess I just uh, w while it's up uh, if you're open to it I think it might be an interesting topic that we should maybe look at because I don't think it's been looked at very recently and maybe Minnesota's yeah. doing the right thing maybe there's no tweaks but maybe there is some tweaks we should know about uh, I know many farm groups are interested and so I don't know if you're open to it Mr. Chair but just an idea Maybe there's uh, several groups that would come in and testify, and, and maybe Commissioner Peterson's uh, attorneys or the Attorney General could talk to us about how how the corporate farm laws are enforced in Minnesota, and uh, uh, either protecting land ownership or or what's what's open, what's available, what's not. I at least find constituents interested in talking to me about it quite often. So I don't know your thoughts on it, but Mr. Chair, just just an idea or suggestion. Thank you, Senator Westrom. I appreciate it. It's actually something I have been thinking about. I was talking to a farmer friend a couple weeks ago, uh, and he told me how he bought his land for $600 an acre a couple years ago, and now it's worth $6,000 an acre. So the question that I think that you're raising is part of a larger conversation about the ability to own land. Uh, and clearly, uh, large corporations and foreign companies purchasing that land and driving up the prices of that land is a component of that larger discussion. And yes, Senator Westrom, this is something that we're planning to talk about in the next uh, couple weeks because of how incredibly important it is. You know, this, this guy I was talking to was talking about how when he wants to pass his, la his land on to his, his kids, uh, his kids are probably going to have to sell parts of it to the point where the farm might no longer be viable just to be able to take on the land. Uh, land ownership is too important to every Minnesotan for us not to have a dedicated, concentrated conversation about it. So Senator Westrom, I very much appreciate that suggestion. Something I've already been thinking about, something we're going to talk about. Uh, members, any further questions? Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Commissioner Peterson and Deputy Commissioner Vobble, for your patience, for sticking around with us, and the brave ones who are left. We have two last orders of business before we adjourn. The first is I'd like to tell you what we're up to next. Uh, obviously, on Monday, it, we are, will not hold session uh, committee uh, in observance of the Martin Luther King Jr. Day holiday. Uh, on Wednesday, when we come back, we are going to be focusing on a topic that came up a little bit today. And that's the question of agricultural education as a way of getting young folks into farming and to help uh, the rest of us understand it a little bit better. So we'll hear presentations from the Minnesota Agricultural Education Leadership Council, the University of Minnesota College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences, the University of Minnesota Extension, and AgCentric, which is a part of Minnesota State. That will be our topic on Wednesday. One last order of business that's very important. Um, there has been some discussion in the Senate about, uh, and some great controversy, over uh, uh, protocol and decorum when it comes to hydration. Uh, and I realize that I've been remiss in not addressing that quite yet at this point to the question that we might call Watergate. Uh, thank you, Senator Westman, for laughing at that. I feel really happy. Uh, and that question being, uh, I don't care. I think a lot of us are here largely because we like to eat. 
Uh, so uh, please don't bring your lunch, but if you got a snack, that's okay. And on that front, one other point of business is today is Hunter's birthday. Jackie, could you get the cupcakes? Um, we got cupcakes for the world for Hunter's birthday. And, and, and just be forewarned, all of you, that if I found out your birthday happens on a day that we're meeting together, I will appreciate you. <laughs> you have been warned. And with that, folks, there being no further business in front of the committee, we are adjourned. <laughs>